In this video, I break down 10 key points that make you a better React developer in 2024, so you can walk away from this video having a solid roadmap of things to incorporate into your future React projects. Hey, my name is Khan, and I currently work as a software engineer for an early stage startup, and I've previously worked for companies like Sony and Google. Over my six year career as a front end developer, I've used popular tools like AngularJS, Vue.js, and even helped build an internal one at Google. But React has become my favorite go to library for building web interfaces. I've condensed down my experience working in React, as well as other frameworks, to give you a few key points so you can develop in demand skills on the current job market, be granted autonomy over how you get your work done and ultimately make more money as a front-end developer. Let's get into it. Point number one is to get a solid grasp of the basics. React has a few core principles that dictate what you can and can't do with the library. There are four core things that are essential to React that you should be exposed to early on in your learning journey. Components, props, states, and the one-way data flow. Let me explain each of these. React's core API has always been built around components. A component in React are functions that accept an input and returns an output. The input comes in the form of a plain JavaScript object and are referred to as props. The output is typically written in JSX, a declarative HTML-like language. Components can optionally keep track of data over time using something called state. Putting this together, we have a core API that allows us to create a component that accepts data as its input, can maintain local state to keep track of what's happening on the DOM and returns an HTML-like thing as its output. Now, React has a way of turning that HTML-like output of components into real HTML DOM nodes using something called the virtual DOM. But you don't need to understand the details here just yet. Just know that there is a translation going on and you'll be able to circle back to this later to solidify your understanding. But critically important is that a component can be used inside of another component. This means that we can build up an entire web applications interface in the browser from one React component tree. One other thing I mentioned was that React has a one-way data flow. This means that a component can accept data in the form of props, but its output is JSX, or a description of the expected DOM. In React, they've made it difficult to pass data back up to parents or to mutate the data that gets sent down from parent components. This makes each component more predictable by only affecting itself and any children that it renders. Now, don't worry if this all doesn't make sense right now. For some of us, it'll make more sense as we build projects and actually use the library. So don't let your lack of confidence stop you from building projects and learning as you go. Point number two is separate logic and UI code via hooks. Hooks are a first class citizen of React and allow components to bring in additional functionality outside of props and JSX. In fact, incorporating state into a component is possible through hooks. But the real power of hooks is that we're able to write our own hooks. This is the perfect addition to components so that we can separate the logic of our application from the UI code. This is gonna be especially relevant for testing our code, which I'll touch on later in the video. Point number three is to know the basics of interfacing with DOM nodes. React for the web is ultimately a convenience that's built on top of the DOM and JavaScript web APIs. Sometimes we'll need to interface with DOM nodes directly, but React's component API and JSX doesn't give us direct access to DOM nodes. This is where refs come in. Reft is React's way of letting us access the underlying DOM element for a React element. However, refs are also useful outside of just accessing the DOM. They're actually a general purpose tool for maintaining data local to a component, much like state. Something I didn't mention earlier about state is that it re-renders the component every time it's updated. If you don't want this re-rendering behavior, refs are the way to go. There are times when you want to keep track of information, but don't want it to affect the DOM rendering lifecycle. Understand refs and how to work directly with DOM nodes. It's going to come in handy. Point number four is to differentiate UI trees and app state structure. Now, this point is more applicable to building apps in general, not just React apps, but it's worth mentioning because it's important to think about building software in this way. Our apps are built with the combination of data and a UI tree of components that render that data. The optimal structure of data that powers our app is typically not the optimal structure for describing what to show on screen. Take for example a system with users, posts, and comments. You might have a series of posts that are written by users. You also have comments that are replies to posts that are written by users. The data shape that you receive on the back end might look something like this. However, the UI tree that renders this might look something like this. Notice the discrepancy. A UI tree dictates that our apps be structured like a tree, while no such requirement is inherently present for backing data that powers the app. Knowing this, sometimes you'll want to opt for creating a translation layer that massages fetch data into something more UI tree friendly. Other times, you might have a central client-side cache that you fetch entities from. 
like a map of all the users that you can grab by their ID. The point here is that you'll want to engineer your code in a way that best suits your requirements. And you won't know how to do this well if you don't fundamentally understand why data is structured in certain ways. Point number five, don't rely on one state management solution. The term state is a loaded term in React because we use it to reference the state feature of React but can also mean the backing data of our application. When the term state management is used, we're referring to the management of the backing data for our apps. Now, the truth to state management is that there is no one size fits all approach. State management is enormously complex. You can use something native to React like the context API or Redux or any Redux-like alternative or some hook-based statement. There's endless options here. I personally love the combination of using local state Jotai and Justand. Jotai and Justand are micro state management solutions that can replace the usage of the context API entirely in your code base. A micro state management solution is one that solves a specific purpose and is intended to be used for a portion of the UI tree. This is in contrast to something like Redux or its alternatives that prescribes being used for the entire application state. Moreover, Jotai and Justan are both used via hooks, making the learning curve easier for someone who's already learned how to use hooks. I like the common combination of these three because it addresses the three fundamental different ways that data is shared in a typical React application. One, Jotai for primitive data that is global and may be mutated by many components in different parts of the UI tree. Two, local state is good for information that is local to a specific component tree or a subtree within the application. And three, Justan for a more complicated data store that needs to be accessed from multiple possibly disconnected parts of the component tree. I've been building React apps professionally for the last couple of years, and I haven't really found a need to venture outside of these tools to manage my application data. Point number six is to manage your client-side cache. I can't emphasize enough that it's important to understand how to use a tool like Tanstack's React Query. React Query is an additional layer of abstraction between your component code and the network requests that you have to make to backend APIs. The primary benefit is that it forces you to key your network requests so that it can manage a client side cache. For example, if I fetch a list of posts for a user with a specific ID and I re-render that component that makes the same fetch again, React Query will resolve the second fetch with the data that was returned from the first fetch instead of issuing another network request. This might sound like an over-optimization for simple apps, but I always use React Query now since it cuts down the number of network requests your app makes by a huge factor. And React trees are notoriously difficult for fine-tuning its re-rendering behavior. This is because programmatic re-rendering is not a first-class API of React components. It's a result of doing specific things like changing props or state, and a component can be re-rendered for so many unknown reasons, like any of its parent components deciding to re-render, which the child does not control. Control. If you want to avoid headaches with network requests, I cannot recommend React Query enough. Point number seven is get good with forms. Forms on websites are the dirty work of front-end development. They are everywhere in apps and pretty much every front-end developer will touch forms as part of the projects they work on. You want to be very comfortable with a form library that helps you be efficient. I personally love using React Hook Form for a variety of reasons, like they have a predictable way of dealing with error states, defining validation rules, and more. It's also feature rich, but still flexible and simple to use. And finally, it's got great TypeScript support. It also supports working with controlled and uncontrolled components, which means it integrates well with any UI component library, whether it's MUI, Chakra UI, or anything else. Point number eight is to unit test logic using Jest and React testing library. The next step is gonna to be to get good at unit testing in React. My go-to tools for this are Jest and React Testing Library. The combination of these two libraries will allow you to test pretty much anything in React componentry, but I recommend focusing your effort on testing logic. An example of this would be like writing a unit test for a hook that translates API data into a different data shape, or a unit test for a hook that acts as a state machine for some user interface flow, like a stepper that navigates through a series of forms. Most tests that are written with these tools will be used for unit testing logic and any DOM output that is affected by that business logic, because there's a more effective tool for testing the interface itself, which is my next point. Point number nine is to learn visual regression testing. There are several different visual regression testing libraries like Cypress, WebDriver, and Storybook. My favorite is Storybook because it also serves as a tool for documenting your component behavior in the process of introducing screenshot testing. A screenshot test or a visual regression test works by taking a screenshot of a component or a part of the screen and saving a golden image. When your code changes, the visual regression test will take another screenshot of that same component or part of the screen and compare it against that golden image. This makes it really easy to catch visual bugs that you introduce in the form of CSS 
CSS changes, JSX changes, or any modifications to the business logic that affect what the user ultimately sees. Visual regression testing is an integral part of a good testing strategy when building out resilient web applications. And finally, point number 10 is to learn TypeScript. Now, this is not React specific advice, but I think it deserves being mentioned because it's just unavoidable when working on most web applications in this day and age. TypeScript is widely adopted by front end teams all over the world, and you'll eventually have to bite the cost of learning it anyways at some point. So you might as well pick it up relatively early in your journey and enjoy its benefits. Learning TypeScript does not have to be daunting. You can incrementally learn TypeScript with loose rules so you can write mostly in JavaScript and learn as you go. Check out this other video for a breakdown of why I think TypeScript is a no-brainer language to learn for front-end developers today. Okay, so those are the 10 points for becoming a React Pro in 2024. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe to the channel and leave any questions down below in the comments. If you're interested in becoming a software engineer or upskilling as a programmer, then check out my newsletter, thecommit.dev. I send weekly insights on how to be an effective programmer and high-performing individual. I'll leave a link to it in the video description. Okay, see you in the next video. Bye-bye.